All right, welcome everyone. Today we're going to talk about platform migrations. So you people, I think, know me. I've been doing this since 1994, closing out my 30th year of open edge work, believe it or not. And I've just lost count of the number of migrations we've done over the past just five years, forget 30 years. We're always doing three, four, five a year. H, all the HPUX customers who went to Linux, now all the AIX customers are going to Linux. So it's just migration after migration after migration. And then I'll add on top of that, all the people going to the cloud. So really there's just been a lot of these migrations happening uh, over the day. So we've learned a few things. Hopefully we can share some of those with you. So. The way I broke down this talk, I just want to talk about your current state first. So where are you now? Kind of an inventory. You need to migrate somewhere. You kind of need to know where you are now before you can migrate to somewhere else. And then where do you need to go, of course, all right? And then we'll detail the steps about how to get there and, and what does go live look like. And then depending how time works at the end, I have this top 10 lessons that we've learned over the past few years that hopefully you won't make the mistakes that we've made uh, doing these migrations. And you guys know me, I think if you have a question, please don't hesitate, just raise your hand, ask anytime, I don't mind. All right, so here we go. So the first thing is first is use a risk-based approach, right? So if you have a 10 user system that's only working, you know, Monday to Friday, nine to five, then a lot about of the stuff you're gonna see here is overkill, right? But if you have a business critical system with 10,000 users, it's 24 seven serving everyone around the globe, then more of the things here will apply to you. So think of it like a menu practically, like see which parts of it apply to you. The more you do, the more it costs, the harder it is. So really look at it a bit that way in terms of a of, of risk-based approach. And a lot of that risk base is how much time can we be down, right? If you're you know, Friday afternoon till Monday morning, then we probably don't have to test anything because we could do the migration five times over the weekends until we eventually get it right. If we have a six hour window, every minute is scripted, 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 because even if you're off by 20 or 30 minutes, that's it, it's a failure and you have to stop, all right? So good, what do we start? Take inventory, all right? Like what, what hardware are you using? What operating systems? What versions of your operating systems are you using presently, right? And what version of OpenEdge? Which, which products have you installed? App Server, PAS OE, Client Networking, 4GL Dev, Enterprise Database, TDE, what exactly are you using in production currently, right? And then in terms of your application, where's, where's the code? Is it on an NFS drive? Is it here? Is it in 16 different places? You know, you have a pro path that has 27 elements in it, right? You have to identify all of that. And, and I, I bolded the word interfaces. This is where everybody gets tripped up, right? What are the interfaces that you have with external systems? When we migrate you from here to there, those interfaces have to work, but it depends where you migrate afterwards. And then for the database, that's you know typically our part. How big is it? What's the structure? Is the structure optimal or not, right? If, you're, if it's not structured optimally, it might be harder to dump and load the database because it's in type one storage areas. For example, it might be corrupt. It might be fragmented. It could be a whole bunch of things. So take that into account. And then the last and the most important one is non-open edge stuff. Like, you know, so we're using PDF include. Oh, we're using a DLL with crystal reports to generate reports. We're using ghost script. We're using, I don't know, whatever. My favorite one is people who write C code. In the old days, you could write a function in C and then link it into your progress executable with OE build, right? So are you using anything like that or a DLL that you call? Uh, you know, and, and if you're running a DLL, do you have the source code to the DLL? Because you wrote that DLL 27 years ago and the guy, you know, since retired. So do you have the source code to that DLL? All right. So inventory, inventory, 
inventory everything that you have. All right? Cool. And then in terms of your <laughs> infrastructure, we'll go back. Um, what everyone does today is they say, oh, I, you know, I'm sitting on this server today. I'm going to migrate to another server tomorrow. They call the sales guy. The sales guy tries to sell them the biggest, most expensive machine they can f possibly sell them, the most cores, the most RAM, the most everything. It, it, it's not really correct. And worse, you know, if you're, if you're dealing with NUMA issues, which you'll deal with potentially on every new server that you purchase, it could actually make things worse. So we literally have customers that have spent a million, two million euros on a machine, and we've had to, you know, uh, disable three of the four CPUs because we can't use them. They bought it as a bare metal machine. We can't use it as a bare metal machine because of NUMA issues. So we have to use it for example, as a VMware machine, or turn off, you know, three of the four CPUs. So watch out for that. And, and what you should really do is just trend your usage over time. You know, whether it's ProTop or Nagios or PRTG, like trend your CPU, memory, disk, network usage over time, you'll know what you're going to need when you migrate, right? If you've got four Xeon Platinums now, and you're only using them 20%, you don't need eight Xeon Platinums in your new machine, all right? Good. Don't forget to inventory all the network stuff, especially the firewalls and all the ACLs, all right? Really, really important. This is another pitfall we see all the time. We bring the system up, but nobody can connect to it because... Somebody forgot some port, UDP port for the classic app server, something or other. It doesn't pass and everyone's scrambling. All right, so do your inventory of all your firewalls, your routers, everything, and all the IP addresses, right? And be careful because your servers could have multiple IP addresses, especially in large organizations. You might have a back a back-end IP address that they use for backups and stuff, and another IP address for the application. And you, you might have something like a classic app server that's linked to one IP address in the ubroker.properties, but now you're changing IP addresses on the new server. You have to watch out for all of that too. So inventory all of your IP addresses. All right, great. And then coming to OpenEdge, Draw out your architecture. Like, who actually has a, a Visio diagram of their application architecture? Sort of. I drew yours like 15 years ago. I don't know if anybody's updated it since, you know. Draw out your, your architecture with all the interconnections to, with other systems, all the interfaces, all the external connections from systems. You know, do all of that there. And... And notice what version of OpenEdge. Are you on 32 or 64-bit? Are you planning on changing OpenEdge versions, right? Uh, especially if you're on a very, very old OpenEdge version. Is that, are you going to migrate versions first and then migrate systems? Are you going to patch up? Are you going to stay on the same version? If you stay on the same version, is it supported on your target operating system? Right? Maybe you're on AIX now running 10.2b and you want to go to Red Hat 9. Well, guess what? 10.2b isn't supported on Red Hat 9. So watch out for that. So you might have to make some jumps in between. All right. And then the last one, and people, one that people forget, it's time now to check your license usage. So two things. One, check what's installed on each server because people are lazy and they tend to just install all the licenses on all the servers and you end up being in license violation because of that. So check what's installed on every server. Make sure that you have a license. Whatever you installed is actually licensed for that particular server and then count how many licenses you're using. Now, again, good time. If you only have a 75 user or a 750 user license, but you know you're running 1,100 users, it's probably a good time to budget to buy the additional licenses as part of the, the, you know, the larger migration project. All right? Cool. And then finally, application code. You know, where is it installed? How is it 
uh, how is it um, deployed? Do you have automated Jenkins, CI, CD, whatever processes that are pushing code left and right from GitHub and builds and whatever, right? How is it all deployed? And will all of that work on your target environment? And identify the business critical workflows because when you go live on the weekend, Sunday afternoon, these are the, the workflows that the users are going to test when you do your go, no go. So what are the, I have to be able to take an order, I have to be able to invoice a customer, I have to be able to drop a pick list to the warehouse so they can pick the order and so on and so forth. These are my business critical workflows. Without them, the business doesn't run, right? So identify all of those. And then when we come to the database, how big is it, right? Are the structures optimal? Are you already using type two storage areas or are you still in a type one storage area? Do you, are, do you have like 800 gigabyte extents knowing that one terabyte is the maximum size of an extent? Do you have fragmentation in your database? Is there a lot of deleted key placeholders in there? So a lot of this stuff inventory that and then you'll make when you do that, you'll be able then to make the decision, should I be talking about refactoring the structure of my database? You know, I'm probably going to dump and load anyways, so is it time now to, to put together a better structure in the database? And is there anything special, like lobs? Like, who, do you guys have lobs in your database, right? So, you, you know, you have a database that's 800 gigabytes and 775 gigabytes is PDFs for example, right? So that's a, it's, another, it's another problem that you have to deal with, right? On the plus side, you could probably dump those PDFs ahead of time. They're not critical for the actual migration time, but then at the same time, you're still dealing with this massive database that you've got to dump, all right? And then don't forget users and sequence values and SQL authentication, all of those other little things that you've configured in your database over the years and years and years that everybody has forgotten about, right? Is anybody using SQL stored procedures in their database? So you, you think no, but I can't tell you no. It's been at least two or three times. One time this year that we discovered a Java stored procedure in a database that they didn't really know about, right? So we dump out all of the different elements from the SQL command, and then you get surprised. Oh, there's a SQL view. There's a SQL stored procedure, right? You have, of course, have the SQL grants, but you could have some of these other uh, elements in, uh, on the SQL side too. And then code page, important. Are you using any DB options, right? Have you enabled runtime security? Did you put in security administrators and so on and so forth in your database? All right. And then third-party tools. I mentioned it briefly, but this is, this is where the trouble is, right? PDF is really common. Custom DLLs on Windows and Unix, really, really common. If you have OCXs or other OLE, uh, you know, automation, what do they call them? Those COM objects, right? We just, we just dealt with a customer uh, who migrated from Classic to PaaS, and in their code, there was a COM object, but the COM object wasn't thread safe, so it worked beautifully in the single threaded app server, but it absolutely exploded when they ran it multi-threaded in the PaaS because it wasn't thread safe. And the PaaS server was just exploding every single day. And in fact, it was running and eating up all eight CPUs. And then the machine, you couldn't even log in. So they were powering the machine off from VMware to reboot it because they couldn't even get a remote desktop into the machine. All this because when they did their migration to PaaS, they didn't realize that they had a non-thread safe uh, a com object in their code. All right, email, FTP, all of these things. And like SSH, if you're SCPing stuff, do you have authorized keys that you have to deal with, right? Inventory, all of these things. 90% of the problems that we have when we migrate are on this slide right here. All the rest goes great, but orders aren't coming in from EDI because, because something. Right, that you got to figure out. All right, stop here. Why do I say that? It's the first time in, I wrote 10, it's probably more like 25 years that you've actually inventoried your entire system, that you can define your entire system here. You've got graphs, you've got diagrams, you've got everything set, you know where you are, and now 
you're ready, okay, 99%, you forgot something, it's in inevitable that you missed something along the way, but now that you know where you are, where are we going, right? So great. First thing, some people make some decisions and some other people higher up in the food chain make some other decisions, right? We were talking about this last week, so some decisions are above your pay grade and some decisions are at your pay grade, right? And you have to inventory those too, right? I, I can't go to AWS, I have to go to Azure. I don't want to go to Azure, Azure sucks. Oh well, yeah, but I'm a Microsoft certified partner, so I got to go to Azure, for example, okay? Are you going Hyper-V or ESXi? Same thing, where we see 98% ESXi, 2% Hyper-V. If you go Hyper-V, that's fine, but you're going to be alone in the room, essentially, when you're having problems, because there's just not a lot of people who have a lot of experience with Hyper-V, at least not in the open edge world, right? And then which decisions are up to you, you know? What kind of server, or if you're going to AWS, what instance type? that you're going to run, for example, right? Who, which cloud provider, which version of the operating system? Are you gonna run Red Hat, Suzy, or are you gonna run Amazon Linux, for example, if you're going uh, to the cloud, all right? And then how much do you wanna change? So this is another one that is really, really important. I mean, ideally you wanna lift and shift. If you're doing a major migration, you're changing data centers, you're moving to the cloud, you're doing something major, you wanna lift and shift as much as possible, right? Because when something goes wrong, you want the least amount of deltas to have to go through to find out where the problem is. So that's ideal. With that said, if you're gonna have to dump and load, if you're going from AIX to Linux, for example, or HPUX to Linux, you have to dump and load. Now is the time to maybe go ISO 8859 to UTF-8, for example, right? Now is the time to finally take away the root password from the 75 people that have root access to your server, right? It's, now is an opportunity for, for you to create a service account and only have the service account start the databases. Right, so it's always you have that clear segregation of duties of who can start and stop and service the database, right? Don't go Windows, you can go Windows to Linux, don't go Linux to Windows, so please don't do that, right? Monolithic to distributed, right? So maybe now you've got classic app server and the database on one box and now you're gonna put the database on one box and you're gonna have a bunch of little PASOE servers close to it but connecting client server back to the database. You're doing the redundant thing with a load balancer. You can do all of that really, really easily when you go to PaaS afterwards, all right? And enabling replication. These, you know, these are things that don't stress me out at all, right? We've done them a million times, very, very low risk. And then moving to the cloud. So who's, is anybody running in the cloud already? Some DR? Are you, what are you running in the cloud? Uh, we are not running Azure or we are the, the service provider we run in our own cloud. Okay, yeah, so you're on someone's private service provider cloud. Exactly. So, cloud. It is cloud, it's absolutely cloud. I mean, it's a private provider, but you're still on, yeah. it's still not in your building, in your data center, right? So you have an IPsec VPN permanent connection to them, big fat pipe and you're able to work like it's another VLAN in your local network. But still, making that move to the cloud is huge, right? Bandwidth requirements for your business, high availability of now the data links, right, is, are super, super important, all right? Uh, I would say that most of our customers have either already moved some of their production or DR environments into the cloud, or in, they're in the process of doing it, but almost everyone has some finger, some foot in one of the, you know, mostly again, AWS or private clouds, but uh, almost everyone we know now on our customer base has something in the cloud somewhere, all right? And virtualization, so if you're not going to the cloud, who's, who, is anybody still running bare metal? You're still running bare metal? Everyone, who's running ESXi? No, ESXi. You guys are running AIX, so that it's the hypervisor. You, you know, not technically. Sorry, right. <laughs> you're probably running 
<laughs> you're probably running e VMware ESXi then, right? So making that choice, right? Are you doing uh, ESXi? You're, you probably already have ESXi in the house. So now it's a question of taking some bare metal server and then bringing it into that ESXi family. And then how do you tweak that, all right? And I did a presentation on benchmarking all of these things. So I won't spend a lot of time about benchmarking, but you can see my presentation from last year where we benchmarked, you know, Hyper-V, uh, not Hyper-V, Azure, AWS, ESXi, and Bare Metal. And we did those comparisons. All right. Recommendations. Any questions so far? Now we get to the technical details here. All right. Recommendations. First, if you're buying hardware, do not buy a lot of cores. It's completely useless. Buy the fastest cores that you can afford. And I would guess that most of you can run on eight cores. All right. And people tell me this all the time. They bought a 32 core machine or they have two CPUs with 16 cores. And you're like, you don't need that. You can almost all of you, I would venture, can run your business on one CPU with eight cores. All right. So find the fastest Xeon, Platinum, Crystal Lake, whatever it's called now, that you can afford. Buy those fast, not the most coarse. Watch out for NUMA. So if you're on ESXi, make sure that there's some, there's some affinity parameters in ESXi that you need to enable to say that I want all eight of my cores for my VM to come from this CPU, because if you give me four and four, my performance is going to be absolutely horrendous. You need eight from one CPU. Same thing for the RAM. The RAM has to come from, they call it a book, right? It has to come from one NUMA node, all the RAM and all the cores. And you, that's a setting you do in ESXi, all right? <clears throat> and then watch out that typically on ESXi, one vCPU is not, is not even half a CPU. One vCPU is a hyperthread. And in the, in the open edge context, the hyper thread gives you like a 10, 20% boost, right? So really, you're, you're, if you're assigning eight vCPUs to your, um, to your instance, you're really assigning four or five cores to your instance. So watch out for that too. All right. And RAM, most of you are not using the RAM. Uh, in your box. So people will buy a box with 256 gigs of RAM, and then we come on the box and 230 gigs of RAM is being used as file system cache. They just don't use it at all. You don't probably don't need that much RAM. And if you do, there's some really cool ways you can use it to improve performance. Give a lot of RAM to the clients so they're not doing, you know, uh, swap files, temp temp files on disk, right? Give a lot of RAM to the database. People tend to give a really big minus B to the database, but they forget all the batch processes and the app servers and the web speeds that are running. Give them a lot of RAM too, so they don't have to swap temp tables to disk, all right? So use it. And you look in slash proc slash mem info, it says mem available. That's how much free memory, I say free, it might be used by the file system cache, but it's available to processes on demand, is mem available. And it's num perm percent in, on AIX boxes, all right? But again, like I said, mostly you under allocate. Take a lot of that RAM, give it to web speed, give it to the classic app server, all right? And then... For the operating system, just use the latest supported operating system for your version of OpenEdge. And at the same time, again, make sure you're on the latest version of OpenEdge. So if you're on 11, don't be on 11.5 or 11.6. Be on 11.7.12.15.18, whatever, one of the later service packs, right? And then if you're on Red Hat, don't be on Red Hat 6. You know, you should be seven, eight. I think, I don't know if nine is supported yet, but, you know, be on one of the latest versions of Red Hat while you're at it, all right? And 99% of our, our Linux clients are Red Hat. We have one now that we just signed that's running Suzy, so, or Suza, whatever you say, so. But almost everyone we know is running Red Hat Linux uh, Enterprise. All right? <clears throat> and, and... What happens in the cloud? So in the cloud, you don't pick RAM 
and you don't pick CPUs, you pick instance types, all right? And your instance types will be a trade-off of, of faster CPUs, more RAM, RAM, less RAM, what they call ephemeral drives, which are local NVMe drives on the machine. And you can play around with that. If you need really, really hyper performance, you buy a machine that has NVMe or rent a machine that has these local NVMe SSDs. Uh, that will give you the fastest bang for your buck on AWS, but understand that if you stop the instance, your database is gone. It just disappears. So you have to have really good strategy for backup and replication and AI, but you get the speed of having local NVMe drives on the machine using AWS at a relatively reasonable price. If you don't need that, then you can go and pick one that's compute optimized Right, so you'll get four fast Xeon processors with 64 gigs of RAM, and you can run your, your business on that, all right? And you probably want GP3 disks if you're on AWS. On Azure, I don't know if I have it here, I talk about it in benchmarking, but usually there's premium disks, they're good enough, or you have to go to the ultra disks, but it's really expensive to go to the to the ultra disks on Azure versus the premium disks. Whereas these GP3s on AWS, they're much more reasonably priced. They're eight cents a gig a month, US, eight US cents, but probably eight you know, Euro cents, same thing. And you get 3000 IOPS as a baseline. So you get really decent performance and then adding more IOPS is not crazy expensive if you need the IOPS. Cool. So what to change? We said the least amount possible, risk-based approach, what we can do that's comfortable, non-root and OE replication, maybe ISO to UTF-8, but I really stopped there. And maybe the, and the database structure, right? Because you're dumping and loading anyways. But again, really not comfortable changing open edge versions for a migration if, if, uh, if we don't have to, for example. Making major changes to the application we don't want to do. Major networking changes we don't want to do if we don't have to. <coughs> All right. So now it's time to actually start talking about doing the migration. So the most important question is how long can the system be down? Because that defines everything. How long can the system be down? And most importantly, it defines how much work do we have to do before the migration to make sure we can fit in that window, right? So I mentioned earlier, if I have 96 hours of downtime, I probably don't have to do a lot of prep work for a moderately sized system to do a dump and a load. Because I know if I'll be finished Saturday morning and if there's a problem, I'll fix it Saturday afternoon. If there's a problem, I'll fix it Saturday evening. I'm really not worried, right? But if I have a very, very small downtime window, again, I mentioned earlier, I need to script every step. I need to put a time on every step so I know that at 4.32 a.m. Saturday morning, I better be doing an index rebuild because if I'm not starting my index rebuild, I'm not going to make the cutoff time, right? And be objective about it, right? That's one of the hardest things, you know, be objective. If you have the milestones with time markers on it, it'll, you'll see that you're an hour behind schedule, right? And if you're an hour behind schedule and you're not going to make it, you can at least go to the, your boss and say, look, we're an hour behind schedule. This is the reason. You can either give me another hour or we abort, no go. Monday we do a postmortem. We try again next month. But at least with time markers, you're very, very objective. Your passion, right? You've been working so hard for six months. You, you eliminate that passion that you want to finish because you have these objective markers in here. All right? And define success. This is another strange one that sometimes people forget to do. So as a database administrator doing a dump and load, for me, success means I have the same amount of rows before and after, right? That I checked that I built all my indexes, that I loaded all my users, my sequence values, right? I can define what success is for the database. You have to define what success is on the application side. I could, you know, create an order, ship it or pick it, ship it, invoice it, get paid, post the payment, blah, blah, blah. 
make a credit card transaction, whatever you need to do. Like you need to define what a successful workflow is and then prove that that workflow works before you're ready to go live. All right. Financial reports are super important. So we're going to close the system at Friday at five. You're going to pull out all the GL reports that you need. Monday morning, you're going to run all, or Sunday, I should say, you're going to run all the same GL reports on the new system. All the numbers better match. And if they don't match, something went wrong in the migration, right? Cool. Questions? I'm going fast through this. All right. So planning your migration. Well, inventory, what's dynamic and what's static, right? And the most important thing here is do a code freeze and a dictionary freeze two weeks before. I can't tell you how many times we're doing a binary load and it fails. And the reason it fails is because they put a dictionary change in like the Friday before we migrated. So we had prepared all the empty databases. Everything was ready to go for the migration and the dictionary had changed in between, even though we had said there was a code for, oh, it was an emergency. You're like, okay, one week is not an emergency, you know, especially not for a schema change. So freeze the code and especially freeze the schema if you can. R-sync everything that, that needs to be relatively, you know, live. You know, files that are coming in that are changing a lot, do R-sync, all right? Code changes, like I said, freeze them a week before, copy all the code, all right? All the user accounts, printers, freeze all of that. No password changes, no adding users, no nothing uh, on the system at least a week before. Now it's easier because most people are are using SAML authentication, so the, you know, the users are not created on the Linux box itself. But if you are, again, no more changes uh, in the week or two weeks before. And then decide how network is gonna be done, right? Are you gonna swap IP addresses? So are you gonna keep the same IP address and give it to the new system? Are you gonna make a DNS change? So is, is everybody using servername.companyname.com and you're just going to change the IP address in the DNS? Or are you going to do something else? Host aliases? So figure out how you're going to do that, all right? When you go change that. Good. And then finally, here, the, the, the database, it's usually the long pole um, in terms of the migration. And within your database, usually there's going to be one or two tables or three. We call them the long pole tables. So they're the ones that define the beginning of the dump all the way to the end of the load and then the index rebuild, right? And a lot of times you'll have one table. It takes longer to dump and load one table than all the rest of the database itself. So LOBS was the perfect example of that, okay? But otherwise, you might have GL detail, right, which is usually a really humongous table. So you want to make sure you can dump that one and load it as fast as possible. Excuse me. And I've done a, a bunch of dump and load uh, presentations over the years. So we've come up with all kinds of fun and unusual ways to load data or dump data so that we can get it done as quickly as possible. All right. So what do we need to do for go live? Well, if I have a really tight schedule, maybe I want to dump from four servers. So maybe I'm going to restore to four different servers, roll forward AI files, and dump from four different servers. I mean, if I have them, let's use them, you know, if I have a tight time window. I could do the same thing maybe for, well, I say roll forward AI at, at go live, right? For loading, it's all going to go across the network to one, one server, uh, to load them, you can. There used to be a trick we could do with binary dumps to force the files to break off at one or two gigabytes, but progress kind of fixed the bug that we used to use for that. Uh, so it's harder. So, you know, if you have your dumping a 300 gigabyte file, you got to kind of dump it and then load it, but you can do multi threaded dumps, which will generate more than one. Uh, file. So there's a bunch of trade-offs you can do there in terms of generating more files, faster files, how you can do them, right? So we, we are working with a customer just this year. I mentioned in my previous talk, they have all their data in the schema area, and the schema area is approaching the maximum size, so they absolutely have to dump and load. So when they did their first dump and load test by themselves, 
they had calculated 18 hours to dump and load. And then with, we, we have a bunch of scripts that come with ProTop and we work with them to optimize it and we got it down to four hours from 18 hours on the same hardware just by optimizing the way we were doing the dump and load, for example. And make sure no third party is, is hogging resources, right? We had a, I remember we were doing a dump and load we were, everyone was ready. We had tested it a hundred times. Come Saturday, the dump was just dog slow and we didn't understand what was going on. And we found out there was a hundred like terabyte Oracle backup going on, on the same SAN that we were dumping to. So we stopped the backup and then everything went back to normal. So make sure that nobody else in other teams who are using some of your shared resources, make sure they're not going to be hogging resources on the Saturday of your migration, All right? Cool, and test. And again, the shorter your downtime window, the more you need to invest in testing time. Test, 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 test. On the development side, use risk-based testing, right? So test the stuff that you know is critical to the business, but unless you're doing a massive change to the application, which I don't like, you can still do just a risk-based testing here, just the stuff that you know is, is important here, all right? And load testing, people forget to do load testing all the time, right? And so everything works great. And then you go live on the system and then at 600 users, performance goes to hell. And it could be one of a thousand different reasons why performance went to hell. But if you're running 600, 800 users in production, make sure that in your testing, you can simulate those six, 800 users before you go live on the new system, right? Otherwise, you're gonna do your load testing on Monday go live time, right? We had a customer, their 1600 user warehouse system. So they have warehouses all over Canada. Uh, so of the 1600 users, probably 1200 are just guys in warehouses with guns to pick, you know? And they were doing a big migration from one AIX box to another, and they were doing an application upgrade at the same time. They brought 400 employees in on Sunday for four hours to load test the system. They paid 400 employees to come in, and the load test failed. The system couldn't handle the load. And we found out why afterwards when we did the postmortem, but... Thank God they brought in their 400 users on the Sunday because they would have found out on a real Monday morning with 1,600 users what, you know, uh, that there was a problem. So we figured out the problem. We fixed it a month later. We did brought the 400 users in again. We did a load test, passed with flying colors, and then they went live two or three weeks later. So keep that in mind too when you're doing your stuff. And document everything. I always say this. Go live is not the time to think. Go live is the time to do. You're going to be tired. You're going to be stressed. Your boss is going to be sitting next to you telling you, where are you? Is everything going well? What's going on? You know, are you on time? Are you behind schedule? Are there any problems? Right? So you're going to be stressed. You're going to be freaking out. So have everything documented and just follow all the steps. All the steps, one at a time. And have I mentioned earlier, have timelines. You know, zero plus 10 minutes, zero plus 30 minutes. This is where I expect to be in my procedure. So, right, you can look at your watch. I'm on time. Everything's on schedule. Everything's going uh, as planned. And I guarantee you not everything is going to go as planned. So if you do need to use your brain at 2 o'clock in the morning, you only want to have to use your brain <coughs> to fix whatever surprise came in front of you. You don't want to be remembering, oh, did I change mod 777, that file, that direct, you know? You don't want to be thinking about all those little details. Everything should be documented down to the last step, all right? Good. And so go live really should be the easiest part of the plan. You should have done this five times already. Everything is documented. And just go, execute, execute. And try to be objective. I mentioned that all, already. Like if something happens and you're not going to make it, you go to your boss and you say, we're not going to make it. Right? Again, either you got to give me two more hours or we abort the system. We abort, right? And try to be objective on that. And Monday morning, all hands on deck, right? So everyone, when the users start coming in at 7 o'clock, 8 o'clock in the morning, everyone's in front of a computer, Protop is up, Nagios is up, PRTG is up, 
All of your monitoring tools are up on the screen and you're watching users log into the system and you're watching how the system is, uh, is, is reacting to all of this. Oops, previous. All right, what time is it? I'm early, I'm good, right? It was three to four? So we do have time to do my 10 bonus, but I'll take questions first before I do my 10 bonus. Yeah. Going from AIX to Linux, would I do UTF-8? Yeah, I would. It's, I don't, doesn't bother me at all, no. So, yeah. Yeah. I don't know. No. <laughs> email. <laughs> email. It should be on, it, it should be on the pugchallenge.eu website, but just email me and, and I'll email it to you. All right? Simon? Oh, yeah, great. Yeah, switch off all cron jobs and everything. Yeah. Yeah, this happened to Tom actually six months ago. Tom Bascom, he was doing a dump and load. And when, they, when the dump and load finished and he did the record checks, the record counts didn't match. All right. And this is a, I don't know, two, three, four terabyte database. There isn't a retry here. So we abort. We'll try again next time. Postmortem, they had not disabled cron jobs on their system, right? They were supposed to, the, whoever was whatever, and someone came in and ran some reports or something. Oh, I remember, sorry. They wanted to run some end of month reports and Tom said, no, we're migrating. And they said, they're read only. I swear they're read only. We can run the read only reports, but they weren't read only reports. They modified data. So his record counts were different, abort, and he was like, I told you we'd finish your business, finish your business, right? And then the, whatever, the next week or two weeks later, we did it again, but this time no reports, no read-only reports running. Yeah. So he says script everything. I don't like to script everything, my opinion. I, li I like to run the commands because I see... I see everything. So unless it's a really huge migration and you just can't physically do it. I, I, I don't know. I, like, you're not wrong. I, I, you're not wrong. I just, I don't do it. I like to, I want to type the commands. I don't know. Maybe it's, I just, I want to type the command. I want to see the results, follow my script, you know, written down and, Yes, okay, the database was this or whatever. So, so you're not wrong, but it's, that's my personal preference. I, I like to run the commands. All right, more questions? Oh, yeah. Yeah, you got to watch out for that. And we talked about gotchas like that about inventorying IP address and, and whatnot. All right. Oh, yeah, that's another thing that happens you have to watch out for. When you're doing your, your testing, so you do your dump and load test, you have your test system before go live, you turn it on, somebody does an invoice print run, and you send 75 invoices by email to your customers from the test system. So make sure you turn all of that stuff off too so that you can't accidentally email invoices or EDI shipping notifications or stuff to your customers. They don't like that. All right, 10 hard lessons I learned over the years, and hopefully my pain will save you your pain. Here we go, number one, oh, running out. This is absolutely unforgivable, you know? You run out of disk space. Like, so you, you go to the sand guys and you're like, I need, you should ask for twice as much disk space as you think you need because something's gonna happen, right? So if you need 70 gigs, don't ask for 70 gigs because you're gonna need 90 gigs for some unknown reason, all right? But running out of disk space on a migration, unforgivable. Number two, your production hardware is not equal to your test hardware. And usually production is more powerful than test, but we have had situations where test is faster than production. And if you didn't test it beforehand, you know, all of your timings are based on one set of hardware and then it doesn't match in the other set of hardware. And disk I.O. is the usual culprit. The SAN is the usual culprit for that. All right. 
Ah, this is a fun one. If you go to, if you're migrating to the cloud, you're, depending on your instance type, you, you have what they call burst credits. So you're given 30 minutes of really, really fast something, say IO or CPU, and then once your quota is uh, exhausted, then you go back to the regular speed, but you do your testing. When you do your testing, you're testing at the burst speed because your tests are not longer than 30 or 40 minutes. And then after the tests are over, when you go live, poof, you go back to the slower speed, especially for disk IO. And don't be fooled also, you could buy on AWS a disk with 20,000 IOPS and pay for that, but then if you attach it to a system that can only do 4,000 IOPS, Amazon will not tell you. You'll pay for 20,000 and you'll only get 4,000, right? So you have to match the IOPS that your system can do to the IOPS that you're paying for from on the, on the disk in AWS, all right? So watch out for that. Number four, this is classic too the whole known host things, right? So you're SCPing files or you're doing SSH commands, the server changed, now you get that error, oh, line seven of known host has this key, now it's that key, do you wanna erase it? So make sure you SSH into the new box and accept all these keys with the accounts beforehand so you don't get this in production. Number five, the whole DNS, versus Windows resolution versus uh, the, the local hosts files, right? So you think you made the change in DNS, but it turns out the IP address was in the local hosts file. The local hosts file gets read prior to, in priority, and then it ignores your DNS change. So make sure you know the order of, of name resolution lookups, all right? And uh, Simon mentioned it, hard-coded IP addresses. So some of the older guns, the R older RF guns, you couldn't put a name. You had to put the IP address where they were telnetting to or connecting to. And so now if you change IP address, you got to go to 300 guns and physically change the, the IP addresses on them, right? Oh, and the other thing you'll see if you're running old guns, maybe they're still on telnet. You forgot, they're not SSH, they're telnet. And now you're like, we need to enable Telnet on the old server because I have 300 guns. But your chief security officer is saying, no, we have a corporate-wide ban on Telnet. And you're like, okay, you need to buy 300 guns and they're 2,000 euros each. Or you can enable Telnet on the server. And firewall rules, right? So same thing, production versus test. Are you changing the IP addresses? But for sure, production is going to be more restricted than test in terms of, IP, of firewall rules, right? Especially if you're firewalling between VLANs here. So again, make sure you test on that new server that the firewall rules are set in place properly. Number seven... If you go to Azure, AWS has something similar. If you have a client server application, and so you're deploying a database server and then Windows terminal servers or VDIs in Azure, make sure you put them into what's called a proximity placement group. That means that they'll be physically close to each other. Otherwise, they may be on the same VLAN in Azure, but they're physically far apart, and there's a very big latency between the VDI and the actual um, database server. So they have this thing called proximity placement groups, which just means when we spin up the two VMs, make sure they're physically close to each other in the data center to reduce latency on the network. All right, almost done. Number eight, <coughs> I mentioned this earlier. Make sure there's no other application sucking up your bandwidth, right? If you have to transfer things from London to Paris for your migration, make sure that nobody else is planning to send 100 terabytes of files from London to Paris on that same day. Number nine, in hypervisor, in, in AWS, people do this, they over-provision. So they, they have eight physical cores, they get 16 vCPUs, but they configure 32 vCPUs amongst all of their... Uh, amongst all of their virtual machines, assuming that, well, you know, when this guy needs a CPU, this guy doesn't need it. So overall, I'm going to maximize my CPU investment. And really, all you end up doing is having 
these, these virtual machines fighting for resources, all right? And there's this thing, do I write it here? There's this thing called a uh, balloon driver. Does anybody ever heard of a balloon driver in, in VMware? So a balloon driver, so if you give 32 gigs of RAM to your VM and you, and you enable the balloon driver, if VMware needs that RAM, what it does is it, it logs into your machine through the balloon driver, requests 16 gigs or whatever of RAM from the, from the, the operating system because it looks like he's using it and then takes that 8, 16 gigs and gives it to another VM. So that's a balloon driver. So VMware can go steal the RAM that you assigned to your, to your virtual machine. So watch out for that too. Okay. And the last one, Cloud disks, all right? Same thing. Are you using IO2, GP2, GP3? You almost certainly want GP3s. And if GP3s aren't fast enough, then talk to me about how to use those ephemeral disks. The risk, of course, when you shut the machine down, your database goes away. But, you know, we do have customers running that way. You do get the performance that you need out of running ephemeral disks or running standard premium uh, ultra disks, right? Ultra disks, super, super crazy expensive. And I mentioned earlier, for sure you can get IOPS and throughput on your disks, but make sure the VM's maximum IOPS and throughputs match what you're paying for on the disks, otherwise you're wasting your money. The disk can do 20,000 IOPS, but the machine it's attached to cannot do 20,000 IOPS. All right? Whew. Lots of information. I can email it to you if you want all of these little points. Otherwise, I'm open for questions. More questions? PK. PK. Am I here? PK at... Uh, There we go, pk at wss.com, and I'll email you the slides. Question? Yeah? Switch off the old server. It depends. Yeah, take out the network, change the IP address, yeah. Turn off the cron jobs, everything on the old server. Stop the databases. Yeah. Yeah. So we, I mean, Protop has automated dump and load scripts and at the end it matches, that's, it automatically counts records that it dumped versus the records that it loaded. And yeah, you can do that too. We actually do the DB analysis before and after because that's the actual gold standard of what was dumped and what was loaded. Yeah. The Linux CPUs are faster. They're faster, much faster for open edge, maybe for other things. So if you have eight P9s, you, if you get eight Intel Xeon Golds, you'll be faster on the Intel Xeon Golds equivalent. So they do run, they run progress code about twice as fast as, uh, as the P9s do. We. Oui, je vais traduire. Euh, il a dit qu'en fait, il, il, on avait des, bah, des données énormes possibles de trouver Linux, parce que bah, sur Linux, on ne peut pas avoir de haute couleur. So the question is, they were told that they have enormous databases on AIX and they cannot have such enormous databases on Linux. I, I've never heard that. So, what, what is enormous? Well, yeah, I mean... No, we, uh, we have lots of customers with four, five, ten terabyte databases on so Linux. Do do no, no, we, 100, 200, 500 tera, whatever. We have no limit. No. The only limit is, the only progress limit is a physical extent can, cannot exceed one terabyte. And so, we, and we say, you know, on if you have modern, fast, very fast hardware, 
your extension ex exceed 100 gigabytes for me. That's, and then, you, you know, talk to Mike Fergal, he always talks about this, but the slower your disks are, the smaller your maximum extent size should be in case you have to do a scan, a DVR, PR, an index fix or something like that, all right? Other questions? We're good? So the question is, when you assign CPU slash core to the virtual machine, you can play with how many CPUs and how many cores. So is it one CPU with eight cores or eight CPUs with one core, which is what your, your virtual machine is going to see. I've never benchmarked to care because I, I, I'll usually just do one and eight, one CPU with eight cores, but I've never benchmarked to see if there's a difference. You turn off what? Hyper oh, hyper-threading. Yeah. If you double the IO, I mean on CPU. On to disable hyper-threading, so. And again, I've not benchmarked it. I mean, if you're really, really, your, if your VMware is really centered around open edge, it's because when you install VMware, it asks you how many vCPUs and that's, you can't change it. It's at installation, right? So if you have eight cores, you can, he'll default to give you 16 vCPUs. You could change it back to eight in VMware, but again, no one ever does that. And I've never benchmarked it myself to see, but you turned off hyper-threading at the virtual machine level. At the BIOS level. Okay, that's interesting to see. I, I've never even thought of trying that. Yeah, try to disable. He's saying disable hyper-threading at the BIOS level and see what happens. But then you have to be careful because you're going to present half as many CPUs. You kind of have to do that before you install VMware because then VMware is going to be screwed up. It's expecting to see 16 vCPUs and half of them are gone now because you disabled hyper-threading. So I don't know how, how VMware will react to that. Other questions? Who's in the uh, Rumble, uh, Pong Rumble? I forget what it is. Tether again. I always screw this up. Is it Rumble in the Pungle? No. Is it, what is it? Battle Pong Blitz. I swear to God. I... I <laughs> Who's in the Battle Pong Blitz tonight? No one, no one is playing? The ping pong competition. You didn't play? Okay. Oh, my God. All right. Guys, thank you very much. Come see us at the booth if you have other questions, if you want to see ProTop or anything, if you want to see some of this stuff I talked about in action, just come and see me. Grab a book here and stuff so I don't have to carry it home otherwise. But thank you.